bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew near to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat.
Father Ronald Knox draws out the true meaning for all of us of the fatherhood of God. In our age, filial piety is perhaps less taken for granted than in any age which went before us. I do not know whether the fault lies with the fathers or with the sons or with both, but it is certain there is a misunderstanding. Perhaps we need a new St. John the Baptist who will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. In any case, if you tell a young man or a young woman of our generation to think of God as a father, they do not necessarily love him any the better for that. A smattering of psychology, imperfectly understood, assures them that it is quite natural to dislike one's parents, or one at least, if not both. How are we to recommend to them then, as a model of all prayer, the formula which begins with the words, Our Father. I think by pointing out to them that when we call God our Father, we are not using metaphor. He is our Father in the full sense, not in some applied sense. When we call him a king, we mean that he is more of a king, not less of a king, than those earthly monarchs who share the title with him. Their sovereignty derives from his, not the other way round. So with fatherhood. It is from God, St. Paul tells us, that all paternity in heaven and in earth is named. It is he who is our father in the full sense, who is the author, not the mere cause, of our being, from whom we inherit not a few lineaments of our features, or a few tricks of manner, but the whole form of our intellectual nature, who nourishes us, not by supplying this or that, but by enabling us to be, who controls us and corrects us, not according to his pleasure, like some earthly father, but according to the appointed law of our own perfection. It is only where and as they fall short of that perfect type that earthly fathers forfeit in some degree their title to paternity. You must not wait till you can learn to understand your father before you learn to know God. It is by learning to know God that you will learn to understand your father.
And Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Prebhunvi Mackay reminds us that God in his fatherly love is always watching for the first sign of the turning homeward of any of his sons who have gone astray. The prodigal son wanted the sort of board and lodging his father could give him and which he could not get among the pigs where he appeared to be ending his days. So he says, I will go home and admit my bad conduct and get my father to give me a job. But as he persevered with the journey back, insensibly his attitude began to change. And there came a moment while he was still some way from home when sonship began to arise in him again and his father from a long way off saw it. Then the two quickly got rid of the remaining distance which separated them. 
There was no thought of a job when they met. For our Lord switches our thought off the poor broken boy back onto the Father's love. Some 30 years ago, Mr. Byam Shaw painted a series of pictures illustrating this story, one of which has always remained in my mind. It is the balcony of a country house. On the balcony, an old man of noble presence is standing. The landscape is bleak, the trees are leafless, the dawn is breaking. The figure is patiently but eagerly watching the farthest point of the road which stretches before him. At his feet, a lighted lantern is lying. It has been laid down, for the dawn is breaking, and it shows that the father had come to watch before dawn had come. This is our Lord's revelation of the attitude of God towards every human soul. Many a fine youth goes through periods of black and wholly unnecessary despair about himself. He sees no dawn. It would make all the difference to him if he could realize that before the dawn breaks, the father has been watching the road. In Browning's poem, 
the Arab physician speaks of the love of God in the raising of Lazarus from the dead. This man so cured regards the curer then as, God forgive me, who but God himself, creator and sustainer of the world, that came and dwelt in flesh on it a while, saith that such an one was born and lived, taught, healed the sick, broke bread at his own house, the very God. Think, Abib, dost thou think? So the all-great were the all-loving too. So through the thunder comes a human voice saying, O heart I made, a heart beats here. Face my hands fashioned, see it in myself. Thou hast no power nor mayst conceive of mine, but love I gave thee with myself to love. And thou must love me who have died for thee. Our Father, which, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
listening to a selection of words and music on the theme of God the Father from Chichester Cathedral. The Cathedral Choir was under the direction of John Birch, the organist Richard Seal. The readers were John Glenn and the Archdeacon of Chichester. 